Awesome. Uh, so hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, thanks for logging in this evening um, to our intercropping producer panel. Um, my name is Johanna Murray. I'm with Peace Country Beef and Forage Association. Also on the call tonight is Kelly from uh, Lakeland Applied Research Association. And uh, I will introduce our, our speakers as we go. Oh, and there's Lance from uh, North Peace Applied Research Association. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna, we've got three producers on here tonight. Uh, each of them are going to do, give a quick uh, slideshow and uh, then at the end of each presentation we'll open it up to Q&A that you can enter in the in the Q&A button down at the bottom and uh, we'll have a bit of a longer question period down at the end uh, if there's anything uh, that you think of after afterwards uh, we'll we'll try and get it answered then so uh, first off, we've got Rebellion Farms, uh, owned and operated by Kelly and Christy Friesen. Uh, they are located between Brownvale and Whitelaw, Alberta. Uh, they are a 5,000 acre grain operation. Uh, they grow wheat, peas, canola, barley, oats, and have tried several other crops, such as faba beans, red lentils, and even soybeans. Uh, so 2019 was the first year they tried intercropping with peas and canola, and they're going to Tell us a little bit more about that. Awesome. So I'm Christy. I'm Kelly. And this is Kelly. And this is our little Piola presentation that we've done for you guys. Um, we're going to kind of go back and forth talking and stuff like this. So Piola actually turned out to be one of Kelly's um, main trials. So every year our farm operates, we do kind of different trials. I select my trials that I want to do. He selects his trials that we want to do. But Piola was one of his main trio trial sorry that he wanted to do so this is kind of some of the stuff that we kind of just went through so the equipment we had is a 6612 seed hawk with 12 inch spacings three inch openers uh three compartment tank and a liquid starter tank and a kit on the drill so we used uh amarillo peas because they're a longer variety uh peas um to pair up with a short variety canola um to get the timing a little bit more uh, in tune with each other and we also see treated peas. Yeah that's right and so we used a clear field canola so 45H76 was the variety of canola that we used in our in a little in our little intercropping experiment. Um, so this is the fertility and the seeding rates and Kelly can probably speak to more to this than I can because I was frustrated and he did most of the seeding so. <laughs> So the fertility, what we did was we targeted a 40 bushel canola crop if we were going to monocrop it. All we did was we reduced the uh, N by 50%. Um, the theory behind it was the canola was going to steal some of the, the nitrogen set by the peas. Um, we also used um, uh, Alpine as a starter, a G22HKW. Um, in furrow, we put the three bushels an acre worth of peas and the two and a half of canola with the cell tech. Um, with the three compartment tank was our, was our problem that we couldn't put down the peas, canola, cell tech and fertilizer at the same time. So what we did was we went and banded all the fertilizer ahead and then come behind with just seed and the G22HKW as a starter, uh, as a second pass. Um, I think if I were to do it again, maybe we might back off a little bit more on the the, the seed on both the peas and the canola because it was it was super thick. Okay. So for spraying, we did uh, just a simple pre-burn prior to seeding. So we did just a glyphosate at the 0 0.66 liter an acre rate. Um, in crop we used solo. So basically any chemical that's used for clear field canola is kind of what we used for peas. Um, we did a, instead of a fungicide pass because it was a little bit of a wetter year that year and there was a high leaf mass index. Um, we did what was called calcium chloride foliar instead of a simple pass of fungicide. 
Um, and then we desiccated with glyphosate in the fall. Um, the calcium chloride, you can maybe speak to that a little bit more. Yeah, it'll, it'll be in the next slide or one of them, the upcoming slides, but it on a regular year, I think the calcium chloride would have been enough to um, make the plants healthy enough to withstand the leaf disease. But we had, I think it was like 22 inches of rain that year and all the leaf mass index in there, it was crazy. So we probably should have went in again with another uh, uh, another uh, fungicide, but we didn't. And it, it still panned out better or good. I just think we may have lost a little bit to leaf disease. Yeah. So here comes harvest. <laughs> harvest was trial and error. Um, honestly, to be honest, I got really frustrated combining it uh, just because the where, where you need to have the reels set. So we straight combine everything on our farm. We don't actually own a swather. Um, so the amount of plant mass that you actually have to pile through the combine is insane. Um, and where you have to have the reels set compared to just straight cutting canola is not what I'm used to. Um, so yeah, trial and error for harvest. Um, we found that uh, the canola preset, so we run all John Deere combines um, and then Kelly um, fine tuned the settings a little bit. It was actually pretty neat. Um, I tried on the P setting and then closed up the, the or slowed everything down on the rotor and stuff. It didn't work. So I went to the P setting um, or sorry, backwards. Um, the canola setting was actually the one we needed to go with. Um, we had to open up the top and bottom sieves to the P preset sitting, settings, which did an okay job, but by throwing out the pans, we were losing probably about, I want to say seven bushels. Uh, once we sped up that rotor a little bit more, it was it, it made such a big difference. So it was all trial and error, whether you're gonna intercrop, you know, peas, peas, oats, peas, canola, it, it's kind of a art to figure out the settings. It's not just a, um, a preset or, or what you previously done. It's, it's a happy medium to catch both commodities, I think. Yeah. And you said even like adjusting the rotor, even as simple as 150 RPM a makes a huge, huge difference. So it's really honestly getting in there and fine tuning and playing with things in order to find what's going to make you your, your best yield yeah. and bring the most seed during into the hopper of the combine. So um, storage and separation. So this was kind of our experience with storage and separation. Um, so we're heavy into grain bags and we store lots of our commodities in grain bags. Um, we've just found that if you're, you know, if you're, you're having a wet year and you're trying to combine and you're trying to get stuff off, we just find that bags are a lot more stable with moistures. Um, so it was kind of a no brainer to put it into a bag, um, after we did combine it. I guess part of that would be this was our first experience. Yeah. So obviously there's going to be higher moisture content in the peas, hopefully lower in the canola. We didn't know if it was going to actually um, like diffuse into each other, if the canola was going to come back up to 12 or, or, you know, if that moisture was going to cross uh, commodities. So we chose to put it in the bag just so that we could deal with it later and it still be safe. Yeah, and we didn't invest a whole lot into <laughs> this aspect. So we ended up picking up a snow cone um, really cheap at an auction and uh, electric augers that we had already had from our dryer setup. And that's actually what they used it. They used, you guys did truck to truck to clean it. Yeah, yeah, it was a very, very rough uh, cleaning process. But part of that with Piola is, it's super easy to clean out. So, uh, you know, the size difference was crazy. It just, we just had to trickle it through as uh, more of a trial if, if this was going to work out or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now we even broke it down into like a little bit of a profitability just to show everybody. So our monocrop canola averaged 43 bushels per acre in 2019. Our monocrop peas in 2019 averaged 49. So our inner crop 
uh, canola averaged 41 and our intercrop peas averaged 22 bushels per acre. And maybe you can talk to that a little bit. So on our, uh, on our monocrop, we, that year, I think we averaged 1050. So rough, rough numbers was 450 bucks an acre monocrop peas at eight and a quarter, I think is what we averaged roughly about that 400 an acre. So on our inner crop, if we use those same numbers on uh, 41 bushels, because it was clear field, we had a non GMO um, market to tap into, which gave us an extra dollar per bushel. So we were 470 uh, an acre for our clear field canola with the peas at 825. We were 181 bucks. So our total total gross was 650 compared to growing mono crops at 450 and 400. So the and there wasn't that much additional cost. I, like we canceled the, each other out by going um, the additional cost for the peas and an inoculant. We could literally subtract off the nitrogen saving. So we were penciling it out that the inner crop costs the same as uh, monocropping. So with that, the ROI was actually another, um, another 200 bucks an acre profit by not adding any more cost to it. So the pros and cons in, in, in uh, our trial is it was, it was, um, the pros, we love organic matter in our soils. We try to direct seed, zero till. Uh, so we have that OM. The OM was crazy from the peas and canola. The, the canola was four and a half feet tall. The peas were three and it was, you couldn't walk through it. And after we sheared it off at the ground, it was just like a one inch fluff on the whole top surface of mm -hmm. the ground. Separation for the canola and peas, super easy. You don't have to invest that much money into it on a small scale. Literally a snow cone and a couple of little augers will, will do uh, 4,000, 5,000 bushels pretty easily in, in a day or two. Um, part of the reason why we did the peola was we've had numerous years where the peas go flat so when you're combining peas in the beginning of the year, um, flat peas, hard on equipment, you're always digging dirt, hard on headers, manpower that operators and my wife are just hate, hate at the peas. beginning yeah. of the year, digging peas out of the dirt. So with this, the peas and the canola, like we overlapped um, when we were banding the fertilizer, you could tell it all lodged over but it was still 11 inches off the ground, easy to scoop up and put into the, to the combine compared to an inch tall, 60 bushel pea crop or 50 bushel pea crop. You can do the cons. You want me to do the cons? Okay. So there was a large stem and leaf mass that had to be put through the combine. Um, when it comes to efficiency of combining, we really count our speeds and how many miles per hour you can actually combine a crop. So combining this crop, um, we actually lost a mile per hour combining um, in comparison to monocrop canola. So just a single field of canola. Um, we actually used approximately 20 more, 20% 20 more fuel to combine it just because there was that much more leaf mass and plant material that had to be put through. And it was a slower process to separate the crops um, just because we weren't set up for it. So it just took a little bit more time. But uh, I think if it was something that we did on the regular, um, it would be, you know, something that we would maybe look into. Look to, into a trauma screen yes, or something like that. Yeah, sure. just, to, just to be kind of, you know, a little bit more um, set up for everything. So, and then we kind of broke it down into things that worked and things that didn't work. So this was kind of our overall, you know, experience on what worked and what didn't. Um, it took a lot of time to figure out the settings on the combine. Um, Kelly threw lots of pans out. So we, every field that we go into, we throw pans or drop pans to determine our losses. 
and he threw a lot of pans out uh, in order to figure out the most acceptable loss um, to balance it kind of out between the two crops. Um, so because we only have a three tank cart, if you had a four tank cart, it would be more efficient. Um, you'd definitely be able to direct seed instead of banding ahead, which is what we had to do. Um, well, last time like that yeah we did it on a pretty small scale i think it was 80 acres and uh it was definitely a full day to band ahead then clean out the drill yes. then recalibrate fill it all up and then do the other it, it, it took a long time we're more of a direct seed efficiency wise um so yeah definitely have to have a four tank yeah um, the peas and the canola stood very well in comparison that year. We had yeah. peas like monocrop peas that just totally completely fell flat that year. So it was, uh, it wasn't as hard on me combining it and my frustration. So, um, there was a lot of leaf disease present that year. Um, I think next year, or if we were to do it again, next time we would do multiple passes. We're very hard into the fungicide. So, and peas are one of those crops of ours that just seem to get multiple passes of fungicide. Um, even when we did red lentils, I sprayed two passes of uh, fungicide on my lentils. Um, so there was, uh, you know, high leaf, uh, high leaf uh, mass, and there was like the canopy. It was canopied in very well, and uh, excess moist moisture that contributed to that. So I think um, instead of the calcium chloride, we would do the two passes of fungicide. Right. Um, we definitely recommend bagging right off the combine and separating at a later date. It comes down to time. Um, you know, in, in the last couple of years, we haven't really had that much time at harvest to get crops off and stuff. So if you're going to do it, get it off, bag it, and uh, separate, it separate it later once the rest of your crops are off, for sure, because it will save you a lot of time and you won't have crop left out into the field. Um so when we did uh, combine it, the canola was approximately 10% moisture and the peas were 15% moisture. And we left them in our bag for what, approximately two months, couple months, couple yeah, months. Sure. and each crop still tested the same when we separated it out um, with the snow cone. Yeah. Um, so we were really happy that there was no like cross moisture or anything like that, or, you know, the peas weren't making the canola wetter or vice versa. So. We were pretty happy with that. Um, so that worked really well, bagging it. Um, and I think overall, if we were to ever do it again, we would probably try green peas. Um, we did do uh, a monocrop of green peas the one year, and we had heavy bleaching just because it turned out to be a drier year. And so we were thinking maybe it would be a good inner crop to try with canola, just with the heavy mass of uh, the leaf mass that's there that maybe it would shelter the canopy would shelter the the green peas a little bit and it wouldn't uh, bleach as bad so that would be kind of our next trial experiment that we would yeah. that we would try and do so and that kind of brings us to the end of our kind of our experience and I guess we'll open it up if there's any questions or anything like that that anybody has that we're definitely more than willing to answer and all ears Awesome. I don't see any questions in the Q and A yet. Lance, have you got a question for him? Yeah, I might have one. Um, yeah, hi, hi, Christy and Kelly. Yeah, great presentation. I uh, just wondering how uh, if you got any splits in your uh, when you were harvesting. Nope, actually um, the. The peas, we opened up the cylinder to, uh, because it was dry and it wasn't hard thrashing, we opened the concaves uh, quite wide. On the pea setting, there's a range on the John Deere. I think there's like eight, eight interval range. And we opened wide, wide open to the top end of the range when we started speeding up the cylinder. So okay. there wasn't much bounce in there. We run Sunny Brook concaves. So they have quite big openings. Um, we run Sunny Brooks uh, when we do monocrop peas as well. So we kind of just took from the experience, like I guess if you were gonna run um, pea concaves in a, in a case or Lexion, you would probably run those in, in uh, 
in the inner cropping as well because it's easy thrashing the canola and peas we didn't actually have that any splits whatsoever in there mm -hmm. yeah, that's we had more in the monocrop, monocrop. because yeah. we had to uh pound it through because we were picking up so much dirt and and they were moist from laying on the ground it seemed like they were from standing up it was super easy thrashing yeah oh, gee. okay awesome we have two questions for you. First one was, um, were there any observable differences in pea nodulation between the intercrop and the monocrop peas? Oh, that's a, that's a good question, actually. You know what? Honestly, I, I don't think we actually... We were digging them up in, in, uh, in season, but I didn't go after to see if the canola was actually stealing the nodulation yeah. away and if they were dying off. No, yeah. that's a really good that's question. That's actually a great question. And, you know, that's something that if we ever do it again, I think that's like number yeah. one thing that we'll be looking out for because we didn't actually, we were just- we, we did it up until fungicide timing and uh, yeah. flowering. But then after that, we didn't actually see watch the correlation between that. <laughs> Neat. Uh, another question was, uh, missed what you used for seeding rates for each? We were three bushels on the peas, on the amarillo peas, two, and 2.8 2. 8 8. on the canola. Uh, yeah, 2.8. And I think it would be safe to go like two and two next time. Um, it was just really, really thick. There was not much branching in the canola. The peas were tight into everything. Um, I think we could back off on the seeding um, that year for sure. Makes sense. Uh, one more question from Lucas. Uh, why haven't you done it again with the uh, ROI you saw on it? <clears throat> so in 2019, we were 2,800 acres. And we that's where we started doing a lot of the lentils, soybeans, faba beans. Trials. We had so many trials on the go. 2020 we actually took on another 2200 acres so that is literally the only reason plus the three compartment tank i really i think the double pass is so inefficient we're like direct seed everything keep the moisture in the ground so when i get my big borgo five compartment tank it'll be super easy and we can just rip it off in the spring but it could be a drought year <laughs> <laughs> right on all right uh if your question if you didn't get a chance to ask your question you can ask it at the end uh but we will go on and we'll go to josh next uh so josh farms in claire's home alberta uh with four other business partners they run cattle hay forage and grain on both irrigation and dry land agriculture uh, Josh is primarily responsible for the grain side of the operation and uh, most of the forage agronomy. Uh, he and his wife, Shauna, have five kids, 11 and under. So with that, I'll let you uh, take it away there, Josh. Good. It's good to be here. Um, yeah, I'll present to you guys on a little bit of things we've learned over the last few years. So I uh, got a presentation here, so we'll go through it. So yeah, as she mentioned, I have, yeah, there's five of five, five families, so that always makes it interesting. So it uh, keeps you honest, because you know, when there's only one or two of you, you can't, you don't have other people that want to look at your books and want to look at your ROI. So if it doesn't pay, it doesn't get to happen here very long. I mean, we're pretty, pretty innovative. We got lots of things on the go, but uh, if it doesn't pay, my four business partners like to crack the whip a bit and say, don't do that. So Anyways, and I do it to them too on their departments. So uh, yeah, we're fairly diverse. We got cattle, forage, native cash crops. We do some dry land, some irrigation down here in the south. Uh, winter wheat, spring wheat, canola, flax, peas, sunflowers, perennial forages, mustard, oats, it, that's been a good one, barley, lentils, and we monocrop and intercrop and play around. And it's really kind of what the land forms says it wants. So um, maybe a few more frost free days than you guys, but uh, about 105. Uh, we're fairly high, 1,000 meters elevation. We're right in the shadow of the foothills. You only have to go about five miles straight west of me, and that's it. No more perennial or no more annual agriculture. It's all cows because those foothills. Um, I was looking it up again because I didn't believe it. Apparently, we get 17 inches of precipitation annually. Uh, 
haven't the last few years. And this last year, I think we grew everything with three inches of in-season rain, but that's what happens when you live in Southern Alberta. And we're in a dark brown to black, or dark brown to black soil zone transition. So is it, next slide. Oh, oh, there we go. So yeah, here's a map. I don't know why the map did all that, but we're down in here. So we're gonna talk about a little bit who we are, benefits of intercropping, how we do it, and kind of the future generation. So that is the presentation. Money, as I mentioned, we got, uh, I got a bunch of business partners and we're a lot of families to feed on not a lot of land when you think about it. So if the economics don't work, we can't do it. Um, I think we're over 30% of the total acreage with like a conventional intercrop. Uh, we mix a lot of varieties together and some other stuff and if you forage, so yeah, we got, Lots of stuff where it's more than one species. Uh, it's become a really big part of our operation. And yeah, it's economics and having cows. Cows make this really easy because if you mess up, it's no big deal. Just feed it to the cows, right? If that combo doesn't separate out, well, I guess you got cheap or sometimes expensive cow feed. Um, oh, if it doesn't look like it works, you can't spray it, ah, you can silage it off. So those cows really make some of the weird and wacky trials easy because you just go with the cows. So um, one thing we've been doing a lot of is, uh, especially on the irrigation, is a cash and forage crop together. So we'll go in, we'll seed a cash crop, and then usually, usually a cereal, we wait till it gets about four leaf. Then we go in and we add some, maybe we'll spray it depending on the weeds, and we'll add some forage species, annual forage species for late season grazing. And if we get good moisture and uh, good, the bigger thing is a good growing season, usually we do it on irrigation, uh, we can get we can get 50 to 100% of a forage crop for grazing in the fall. And it does ding your normal cash crop yield a little bit. Usually we're running about 90% of a normal forage yield, but uh, then you get a full graze behind it or even a half a graze, the numbers really start to look really good. You can start to feed cows pretty cheap. Um, on the straight cash crop intercropping, um, down here in the south, sometimes when it's a little dry, we don't quite get the over yielding effects, right? Um, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. I mean, we don't just, yeah, it depends. So, I mean, it's one of those things when people say, well, there's an, always an over yielding effect with intercropping. Um, depends. Uh, don't count on it with your numbers. Try it for yourself. Maybe, hopefully, you will. Um, but yeah, better habitat for beneficials, lower fertilizer use. And uh, the bigger thing, and I know Friesen's kind of mentioned it, is it allows to get higher quality on crops we normally can't grow. With the short grow growing season, like we're quite a bit shorter growing season than even Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, Tabor, you know, those real specialty crop countries. So uh, crops like red lentils, the red lentils are a big risk here, um, just with cool nights and some of that. And chickpeas are a big risk. So we can grow those crops when we intercrop them. And then we can get into some of that high value crop where it's kind of a no go if you don't intercrop them. Uh, and the really big reason we like it, I mean, besides money, I mean, we, everybody likes money, right? But uh, is system stability, right? If one crop is weak, we've got a lot of salinity down here. So if you grow like a pulse and a brassica together, the pulses, they just do not like salinity. They do not like wet feet, right? But usually the brassica, it will like that a little better. So the brassica will do pretty, or as good as it can, or a lot better in some of those saline, saliner areas or moderately saline. And the peas will do a lot better on the high dry hilltop. So basically every square acre of land you have is going to produce maximum amount, right? Um, and it gives very good potential to weather climate extremes. Uh, you know, if you get a hailstorm or whatever, usually peas, I mean, if they even see a hail cloud, they blow open the pods and die. It's just how peas work. I and mean, we're in a pretty high hail zone where canola, you know, it usually bounces back. So, you know, there's things like that. So it's basically, we're trying to use biology to induce stability in our systems rather than chemical solutions. Will it work for me or you? Um, it depends. Uh, as with all things, you can make the mass do whatever you want, depending on what values you place on things, uh, what values you place on biological solutions versus chemical ones. And the cost to separate 
the way and the cost to separate these combinations will dramatically affect the numbers. Um, and in general, uh, down here, even, you know, peak canola, that's a great combo. We started out with that. But if you don't use intercropping to solve an agronomic issue, chances are the economics are just barely there and you won't make enough to justify the extra work. Um, peas, yellow, yellow pea canola, I mean, we started that in about 2005 and we've had pretty much something ever since. Yeah, it's been a long time. And uh, it doesn't, that's where we started. It doesn't really work. We don't do it anymore as the advantage is too small. There's not quite a big enough over yielding effect. There is some system stabilities. Maturities are really not ideal on peas, yellow peas, canola. And uh, it's a really good starting point, but it was only marginally economical. So, I mean, it's a great starting point. It just doesn't work for me, but it's, it was a, it was kind of my gateway drug. So I'm, I'm all for yellow pea canola, but just not for me. And yeah, you gotta, they did freezings again. They touched on it. They need to, you need to uh, try to match up the maturity. So you need to get a long season pea and a short season canola. We've done lots of Polish canola actually works really good. If you're going to intercrop with peas, you get a good old Polish canola, but then you lose even more herbicides. So anyways, as I mentioned, got to solve the agronomic issues. Flax, large green lentils. It's, there is some weird things. You look on the chart and flax and a large green lentil should never, ever mature on time. They should never mature together. Flax is always a December crop and lentils are kind of middle of harvest, mid-September crop. And for some reason, when you put the flax with large green lentils, the flax matures sooner and the lentils mature a little later and they work. And it's large greens, you know, the highest value lentils typically you can grow and uh, works great. So some weird things happen. Uh, lots of peas, brassica, uh, tried the greens. We've done lots, do lots of forage peas now because there's a good market in them. Uh, some premium markets if you can find them. So usually we grow in a mustard and, uh, and a pea. And so we like to grow a pea that grows nice and tall and then likes to go really flat. and uh, that's how we do it. So then we use the brassica to hold up the peas. And then we can grow a higher value pea, make a little more money. And uh, the bigger thing I really like about that combination is residue. You've got to keep the residue down south here where it's hot and windy and dry. So I do not like monocrop pea residue or monocrop pulse residue in general. It's just too prone to wind erosion. And there is no residue. There's no soil armor to hold in the moisture. So it will hurt you the next year. So that little bit of brassica in there just seems to make that stubble stick around a lot more. It probably plays with your carbon nitrogens ratios and stuff a bit. So that's a big factor for us. Um, we usually plant winter wheat in behind that combination and winter wheat survived very well, actually, where if we could plant winter wheat behind just a monocrop pea stubble, eh, chances of it surviving are not as good, right? Uh, flax chickpeas. Uh, disease issues are dramatically reduced. Again, better post-harvest residue. Uh, but herbicide options, right? Uh, you got to get pretty creative with your blue book and, uh, and you got to think about cleaning. So we've done a lot of combos over the years. At the very last slide, it'll be one. Um, but this is my quick will it intercrop checklist. Because once you start doing this, it's a little bit like a drug. You just, you're always thinking, well, maybe I can intercrop this and this. But uh, you always got to think about rotation and volunteer control. So how does that work? How do you, how's it going to affect your rotations? Can you, are you going to have volunteers you can't control from the previous crop? Or are they going to cause volunteers you can't control the next year? You need some sort of seed size difference. So you can actually separate them. Flax and canola would be a terrible combination um, because, you know, you can't, Cleaning flax out of canola is just, if there's volunteers, it's just a pain in the neck and you can't really color sort them. You know, there's, there's, so that, you know, just right away, you can't do that because the sorting, right? Unless you're going to use it as like a livestock feed or something. Herbicides. What are you going to do for your herbicides? Oh, well, the better question is, do you need to do something? What are you expecting to have or a few weeds? Okay. Um, and will buyers allow the combo? I know peas and barley is a pretty good combo, peas and malt barley. Apparently the buyers, for some reason, the maltsters just don't like anything associated with peas and malt barley. I don't know why. Um, we're not really in the malt barley business. So, but I mean, you gotta maybe talk to your buyer about some of these things, right? Just make sure you can actually sell it. 
So now we're into the fun part, the part that, you know, I always did best at school was pictures. Um, and here is, as you can see, we're pretty heavy. We like our residue, we use shellborne headers for everything. And so these are sunflowers. And I think those were done pea. And then over here, we got a pea canola, I think. Not sure what kind of pea. As I mentioned, we use shellborne headers for everything, shellborne stripper headers. So be a little more on them late, later. And uh, that creates a few other opportunities. So this is our relay cover. I think here's, here's some pretty thick grass. So yeah, this is a irrigated wheat crop, probably did about 130 bushels, I think. And then we got a pile of grazing out of it after. So you go in with your shellborne and yeah, I mean, if you combine this conventionally, I think you'd have to swath it and let it dry and probably hurt, but we just go in with the shellborns and strip the dry wheat out of the green grass and away we go. And then uh, a couple months later, we come in with cows and get lots and lots of cow feed. Um, but when you do a combination like that with the relay covers, because now you're trying to extend your growing season, I can't spray, I lose my fall spray. Now, what's the cheapest way to control most perennials is a good fall spray, right? A little bit of glyphosate in the fall just does wonders. So when you do that combination, you don't get a fall spray. Now the question becomes, well, do you need it? Um, here, this was a check where we had no relay cover on the grass or on the wheat. I think this is wheat or barley. We do it with all kinds of cereals. And as you can see, here's a 40 foot strip where it's just solid flicks, weed and thistles. Where over here, it's a lot cleaner. So, so sometimes, you know, oh, sometimes you don't need the herbicides with the intercrop or the relay covers. It's kind of all blurry. What's an intercrop? What's a relay cover? What's a forage? Um, Here's sunflowers, they're just so fun to intercrop with because you got so many different heights and canopy differences. So this is actually a triple crop. We got a sunflowers, then we got faba beans, and then we got red clover or crimson clover. That's crimson clover down below. You can barely see it. You can see it a little bit here um, to try to fix some nitrogen on some irrigation. It was a very, very high moisture combo. You got some land to dry out, it's a, it recommended. Um, and then here's sunflowers and canola. And we'll discuss why I do so much with sunflowers in the next few slides. So we love our stripper headers. Yes, the wife, there's lots of good jokes about that. And uh, yeah, and everything we basically, if we can't harvest it with our sunflower header or our stripper header, we don't grow it, that's the rule. So all these crops I talk about, we run them through our shell borns. Uh, we just love to conserve moisture. We love to conserve residue. So yeah, shell borne, Reynolds.com, I think. If you just type in Shelbourne stripper header, there's lots of YouTubes, lots of explanations on how they work. It's a very old idea. And uh, sorry, my slideshow is bouncing around a little bit here. And we use them for everything. So this actually here is what it looks like when we seed. So we kind of always got to start at our headers because to get through, I mean, that's wheat stubble. It's probably well over two, three feet tall. I know some of our irrigation, you can have four foot tall stubble that we're trying to seed through. So that necessitates a disc drill. Um, this is a flax lentil combination. We're stripping it with the shellborns. And this here is monocrop canola. We strip monocrop canola and it works really good. The pod, uh, use a pod chatter variety and away we go. And you can take it a little bit greener. And so yeah, those stripper headers, we love them. They, we feel we get a lot more yield out of them even on the monocrop side. And I mean, down south here where it's dry, that's what we, We've really had good luck with them. So that's what we do. But because of the shell borns, we have to seed with a disc drill, as I mentioned. So our main one is a Deer 90 series opener. Here they're on the rack that can be built. But uh, in our higher moisture and some with some higher moisture years, if you get a lot of residue, this is a old FlexQuest 6000 with modified pillar lasers openers. Uh, we pull that out every now and then. And then because I was too cheap, to uh, keep paying full canola seed rate when we're, mon we don't monocrop a lot of canola anymore. Uh, but, you know, we got this planter here that we set up for canola and they all seed through that stripper stubble really well. And we have intercropped with everyone. This one here is a sideband. This one here is nothing. We're back to single shoot and this is single shoot as well. But as you see, the reason we've done so much with sunflowers is because you can always just throw sunflowers in one box and then you put in a different plate and you put in another thing and another thing and another thing. So with the planter, it is so easy to intercrop because you can just change your plates and have combinations of all kinds of things. So the planter is actually a very, very good intercrop machine. So that's why there's all kinds of work done with sunflowers because when the 
I can just throw things in the box and do 20 acres here and 20 acres there and learn things. And they take really nice pictures. So, so yeah, we use pretty much our main workhorse, especially in this dry cycle, is our 1890 single shoot. Um, we seed everything with it, intercrops, monocrops. Um, when we had double shoot capable drills, we use the mid-row banders a lot to place the intercrops. And that works good. You use your fertilizer runs usually on 20 inch on the mineral banders, you plant your uh, crop that you think takes the wider spacing. So if you're doing a pea canola, you put your canola on your 20 inches and your peas on tens, it works really good, did it for years. Um, I am not a fan of mixing species in the same row, two passes like Rebellion Farms did, that's a great way to do it. Um, but yeah, I'm not a fan of mixing species in the same row for, uh, there is arguably some mycorrhizal associations if you, put the two species together the roots will interact and maybe share nitrogen whatever a little better but what we found is every time you mix the row it's a little harder to get things the ideal depth uh split the difference so you could seed on a little shallow for peas a little deep for canola and probably make it work but what happens is if you get a flea beetle clip starts eating on your canola or your pea leaf weevil it's a big pest down here starts chewing on your peas or your lentils are just a little slow or your chickpeas get ascochyta and it just slows them down. If they're in the same row, the other species will just go and dominate, right? So if your canola gets, if you're hoping for your canola to hold up your peas and your canola gets flea beetles, well, now your peas are all flat in the fall and your four business partners are mad at you. So, but when you put them in separate rows, you can get your depths better. You can get your disease breaks a little better. And what'll happen is if that happens, it's a, big month or six weeks before the plants even start interacting again. So then the plant has time to catch up. So if you get a little bit of flea beetle damage, you know, the canola can catch up. You get a little pea leaf weevil, the pea, and we've just had better luck in making sure both species thrive when they're in their own little row. Um, the other option we've done lots of is take our RTK on the irrigation. We like to seed on narrow rows. Like our, we got 10 inch drill, well, they're all tens and 15s planters 15 everything else is 10 we like to seed our irrigation even on our like when we're seeding wheat we like to seed our wheat twice i like five inch spacing so if we're seeding irrigation a lot of times we'll roll over it once and then you can just shift over five inches with this with the rtk and add the other species um and there is an opportunity with some of these carts and we're just we did a lot of playing the last year two years ago we started and now we're really starting to try to figure it out for variable rate species changes so we'll try to guess which species is going to do better on which landform. And then we'll, so like on the hilltops, you'll bump up your peas and you put your brassica lower in the, in the saline areas. And flax, lentils, same thing there. Those ones we're having a harder time figuring, but, and on uh, relay covers, right? We know there's some spots that are just not going to grow your cash cereal very well on that irrigation where it's really soggy. Some of your lower spots, even with the VR irrigation. Um, so then, oh, let's just bump up the, bump up the rate here and lower it there. So, so it's just a little bit like variable rate fertility. You figure out what you want and then you can play with your rates. And I think that's kind of going to be our next step. So we had three tanks on our drill and then we added this Balmar into our other drill to make this, this drill into a four tank unit. So it solves some of the problems. Um, we typically don't fertilize. Most of our fertility is all broadcast. So a little bit of phosphate, but most of these combinations you know, we can, we use more, we could do it with a three tank cart, but this Valmar is how we made our single shoot drill into a double. So the Valmar has got its own fan and we put in a second air pack here and then we labeled all these hoses. So when we're seeding intercrops, we just move the hoses here. It takes about 20 minutes and then the Valmar feeds the front rank. So we throw our one species, usually the, well, it's, it's only a, about a, 30 bushel Valmar, so you throw the species that doesn't need flax or your canola or whatever, and you throw it in that one and it goes down the front rank on 20 inch centers. And then you feed your air cart, can feed the back, and it goes on 20 inch centers. And uh, it's just a little cam lock, it injects right into the edge of the tower here. And uh, we really like it. It's, it's a way to get around this. We use it actually originally for monocrop. We used to put our inoculant in there and our canola seed in there way back when on a different drill to uh, get a fourth tank for small crops. 
and uh, we use it for seeding grass. We custom seed a lot of grass and we seed a lot of grass. We're always taking out grass. We run, about, we put in forage for about five or six years then we'll spray it out, crop it, and we just keep moving it through. So we're always having a perennial forage. So we're always seeding, we're always taking some out. And that box works really good for that as well. So it's more, it wasn't really just an intercrop box. We do a lot of other things with it. Um, we're definitely getting more and more CTF all the time. Uh, either 40 or 60 feet wide or 30. So it's all multiples of 120. Um, it works great for intercropping, as I mentioned earlier. You can do things, you can go into crops multiple times. And uh, we're not crazy CTF evangelists. We just get our tire widths fairly close within a few inches. We still run multiple tires and we just play with the tire pressures. So the tires that are going to be sitting on the trams always have lots of pressure on them. And then the tires that are off the trams, we just put down to like five PSI. So, so when you're going on the good hard pack trams, the tires work, you don't really put a lot of pressure on the crop or anything you're in. But if you ever get into a muddy spot, then all your tires start to dig again. And it's a lot cheaper than trying to get everything on tracks and all of that. Because A, uh, you know, family politics and farming with business partners. I got a, my mechanic hates tracks. We're never getting track machines. So anyways, so you got to do with what you got. As I mentioned, it's stripper headers. The, Rebellion Farms did a great job of explaining on combines and storage. They took the wind out of my thunder on storage and uh, hard to thresh crops. You just figure it out. Usually you just make one setting at a time and it's like setting combines. Um, but what we found on fl flax and lentils, flax and chickpeas is we put in the small wire concave, cover them right up with filler plates a lot of times if they're hard to thrash and just run that rotor really, really slow. And you seem to be able to thrash out, like flax is a very hard thrashing crop in general, and the flax will thrash out and you won't crack the chickpeas. So that's kind of how we do it. And kind of, there's some tips and tricks. Um, logistics are key. Uh, we're big grain baggers anyway. We bag everything as a rule pretty much. Um, but with intercrops, it just works so great because yeah, no spoilage issues. You just throw everything in and you don't have to worry about it. And you just bag it and it's working really good because we can, oh, when the crops start to leave, then you pull them into the plant and you separate them. So it works, it works good. And yeah, they did a very good job earlier of explaining some of that. Um, the easiest way to separate an intercrop, I mean, it's with a cow, right? My great grandfather, he intercrop forage species way back in the, oops, sorry about that, in the 1900s, right? So. So, you know, if you can use a cow to separate it, that's great. So if you can do your relay forage, like I talked about earlier, just go in there, you graze it with a cow. I think these cows, it's actually on a multi-species cover crop, inner crop, I don't know what you call it, and they're grazing it. So um, I think what we did here, actually, is we silaged a barley, a barley pea inner crop. We silaged it off and then we reseeded it again to a multi-species and then we're grazing it here in late fall, but I kind of forget. Um, seed cleaning, seed cleaning. If you intercrop long enough, you will get into a seed cleaner. And it's like there are many rules in life. You can only pick two of them. You can pick good, cheap, or fast. And you can only pick two. Um, we started with a rotary screen, even PTO augers. We didn't even have electric augers. So uh, we moved into electric augers. And I mean, we've been running this rig for oh, 10 years now. And I mean, we've separated thousands and thousands and thousands of tons with it and, you know it, it does a really good job and uh it's a great it's a gateway to a seed plant though so just warning you um, and as you can see we can get some bins and trucks and carts and it once you kind of get it set up it just rolls and the shop's not too far away and you look at it um then we went and bought an old trailer based seed plant which is where a lot of people will go next um I like trailer-based seed plant because if you're wrong and it's a dumb idea, you can always just take it to auction or sell it again and get your money out. So it's a good way to do it. Um, and then unfortunately, that has led to other things. But if you intercrop long enough, you're going to end up with a seed cleaner of some sort. And if you keep at it, you're going to end up with a seed plant. Um, a lot of seed plants are just not capable of actually cleaning intercrops as the screening sides are not big enough in a monocrop plant like a standard plant you see all over the country you know 10 to 20 percent is a big cutout if you got 10 to 20 percent screenings 
you can have up to 50 in an intercrop. So a lot of times the, the clean grit or the screenings, legs and bins and all of that aren't big enough. A lot of times you're re-cleaning the screenings, like in almost all our combos, we clean and then we clean them. Then we clean one product to nice high spec. Then we'll turn around and clean our screenings again. So if you're cleaning like, uh, I guess we've already been using pea brassica, we'll clean our peas to a really high spec. And then you'll end up with all your split peas, all your pea dockage and your canola side. Well, we'll clean that out again. Usually it's mustard now. And uh, now you, then you got all your dockage, all your splits, all your cracks out. And you got two very nice products. So these facilities make great synergies with grain milling and drying. We got a the plant we're building right now is a, a mill already. We're looking at a big feed mill. So it's, it's going to be a seed plant and a feed mill. And a slot for grain dryers. So if you guys up north have grain dryers anyways, or feed mills anyways, you know, a lot of times seed cleaners work really good with them. And what you do to optimize your screenings dramatically affects profitability. So we're, yeah, the, the screening side, it, it, how you deal with them, where you sell them, um, that, that's just money straight in your pocket. So uh, this was about a year and a half ago. And this over here was this fall and yeah, see, now we're getting crazy. So I think this was this summer. We're way, way ahead of this. So this is a gravity table going up. So just, just want to say, don't say I didn't warn you. If you start intercropping, you'll get a seed plant. And uh, depending on how you do it, a cheap seed plant's a million bucks. Uh, we'll be a little bit under that, but we spent a lot of time trying to source a lot of used stuff. I've been buying used parts for years and I'm building all my own whatever because I just love machining and welding and all of that. So, but uh, that's a risk. I know one thing we did a lot of when we were just getting into it, especially on the peas, is we always knew that you have to clean some peas for seed anyway, or you have to clean some blacks for seed anyway, or you have to clean some lentils for seed anyway. So we'd just be, oh, this is our seed quarter. So we'd grow our combination. Then we'd haul it to the local co-op and then we just take the clean stuff off as your seed, right? So then you, you could learn and play with some of these combos and then the cleaning cost, you kind of had it anyways, because that was your seed. Now, if you're going to clean it and then just sell it into the commodity market, well, it's kind of can be a waste, right? So, and uh, yeah, that's how we found out that our old community seed plant that was built in the sixties really doesn't like intercrops. Um, so yeah, that's what we're doing. Um, more livestock integration of just trying to grow perennials, get more cows. My brother runs the cows, just trying to get that on the land more. And uh, this whole intercropping adventure has led to on-farm exporting. So we now, most of our products is starting to leave in sea cans now. So this is kind of how we do it. We actually just, once it's clean, you throw it in a sea can and you export it. But a little bit of that's geography. Um, we're very close to the shipping container yard in Calgary. So they can be out of the shipping container yard to my farm in about an hour. We can usually load a can in under an hour, well, it's 20 minutes if all goes well, but you know, an hour time you do all the paperwork and back. So you can be back at the can yard in three hours. So that makes a very low freight cost for the cans. And of course, Calgary is also the closest agricultural port or closest agricultural city in react with big volumes for some of this stuff to Vancouver. So we're the lowest freight for a lot of these commodities. So even guys like in Regina or whatever, they have a harder time with this. The numbers don't work as well. So uh, by cleaning it to a very, cleaning the intercrops to a very high spec, because you're cleaning anyways, you might as well clean it to a very high spec, uh, try to find suppliers and export. So that's kind of why we can justify some of that. Oops, uh, I'm go back. Oh, I think I lost, oh, go back. Oh, there you go. Sorry, guys. Um, I always get asked, what's going to make intercrops be adopted? Well, it's a change in management after attitude. And often it has to be driven by a lack of profitability. Uh, humans rarely change unless they're not making money or they have no choice. It's just we like our comfort zones or you get bored. Um, peer group power. I've got a, quite a few like minded guys down here in the south. We're spread out over a little bit and we talk lots and done lots of intercropping and and we talk and that, that helps a lot. And uh, research facilitators, I know there's a lot of peer reviewed work that has been done and a lot of literature searches that has been done. I mean, we hired a ex 
Albert Egg scientist. And it's amazing when you ask him about, oh, this combo or this interaction or this or this or this, he somehow knows how to do literature searches and he can throw me six or seven papers in an evening. And so that really helps because a lot of this, you know, a lot of this work has actually been done. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. I've actually done really very little that's actually new. I've just pulled papers and tried to figure out how to make it work. Um, and yeah, you just got to get, get the government and the policymakers in the fields. And another thing is when we lose our herbicide options, then we're just going to have no choice, right? So at the rate glyphosate's becoming resistant to some stuff, at the rate fluoroxypur, you know, some of these chemistries are just becoming less and less effective then we'll have to intercrop, right? I mean, great grandpa, he intercropped out here in the prairies lots before they had chemicals, right? Cause they didn't have a choice. And uh, my family way back in Europe, they were intercropping for generations because they didn't have chemistries. And as soon as the herbicides came, good herbicides came, well, that killed all this intercropping, right? So um, probably just gonna leave that here for a bit here. Cause the next slide here is just some of my information. So. I'll leave that here. These are some of the things that we've done and have been very successful for us. Um, yeah, I don't know if mixing varieties is considered an intercrop, but we've had really good luck with mixing varieties. And I think I kind of covered it. And as you can see, we do a lot of forage combinations. So flax works really good. If you're trying to get into the straight alfalfa business, you can use the flax to establish alfalfa even like an annual cloak. Like there's lots of, there's lots of combinations to think about and lots of combinations to try, so. Awesome. Well, thank you, Josh. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you right off that. Um, for your understory crops, for those perennials, um, how are you seeding that into your standing cash crop? You mentioned that you'd seed it at the four, late, four leaf stage or after your herbicide application? Can you expand on that a little bit? Um, yeah, no, that ties in with uh, the disc drills and the CTF. So our big 60 foot drill, disc drill, um, you know, disc drills, even if you do hit the old rows, they need very little disturbance, right? And also that's one of the reasons we're on 10 inch rows, it's just easier to get in between them. And then yeah, with the CTF, right? All our tires, all our, we have permanent trams, right? Every, well, every 120 feet is a blank, right? So. Literally the drill is driving on a blank every other pass. And then even the pass where it's, we seed it, uh, you know, the tires and the trams, it's the way the tire pressures are and the way the rims and everything are set up. We actually don't trample very much. And at four leaf, you don't trample too much. But the bigger thing is the disc drill, right? Like if you've got a disc drill, you can go back in without a lot of disturbance. Um, broadcast down here, although, even on my irrigation, we've had very poor luck. Um, I know Derek Axton, I talked to him lots and he always told me that uh, broadcast seeding is, uh, you might as well just take the money you would have spent, donate it to your favorite local charity because it'll do more good in your community than if you broadcast. So we've had very little luck with broadcast spreading uh, the relays. So yeah, but disc drills basically, disc drills and CTF and it all works. That's the short answer. Awesome. Um, with that tall residue, uh, do you have issues with that wrapping around your firming wheel is the other question. Um, closer wheel, if you got the spiked closer wheel, sometimes. Firming wheel, uh, as long as you don't grow hemp, you're fine. So generally no, um, inter row seeding helps a little bit there too, right? So like we try to put like everything's on RTK. So we try to just shift over five inches from last year's rows and put all the openers in between. So then you're actually not in that tall stubble. Um, but now if your stubble has gone flat or you've had some cow, it, yeah, we haven't had a lot of luck. I know hemp, we literally had to tie up the closing wheels or spike closing wheels. We literally had to tie them all up on the disc drill seed without a closing wheel and then go in with a big land roller, which I just hate, and then roll it to try to close the furrow. So right. hemp, yeah, just, yeah, <laughs> don't grow hemp. That's the long and short of it. <laughs> On that note of uh, trampling stubble and stuff, uh, do you feel you sacrifice the benefits of tall stubble if you have cows tromping around in November and December? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, Yes and no, it depends on how you graze, right? Uh, I mean, I'm very weak, well, not weak, but I'm nowhere near the grazing guy that 
my father and my brother are. Um, they they do all the grazing, but I mean we're very HILF, so very take. The general rule with grazing is take half, leave half, and I know with the livestock integration, especially down south here, I mean, feed was worth a fortune. So we grazed a lot of stubble land. And uh, the rule is you, you can graze my stubble. But when I say I want them off, they're off. Because a mm -hmm. cowboy will turn them on there and they'll great. Well, I mean, my brother, he gets it, but they'll graze until there is nothing left, right? And they then you will lose all those benefits and compaction. And cows can cost a lot of money grazing on stubble if it's done wrong. And they can even cost me, like if we're into another dry cycle, like we did a lot of fields of it and they can cost me, they'll cost me a little bit if it's dry again next year. We're fully aware of that fact. Now we made a lot of money grazing this fall. Um, so, but the trick is, yeah, get them off. And my brother, he always says, well, I need, he usually knows where he's going next. He says, well, I can't get them off today. I need, the rule is three days notice. Try to give me three days heads up when you want them moved and then he gets the next field ready. But uh, the trick is just don't graze more than half. Like you're better off with the cows to take hit all 25% on all your land than half your land and take more. So, and I mean that a lot of that theory is the same with perennial forages, right? With grass and whatever, just take half, leave half and come back later. And there's no such thing. The residue on the surface is always a good thing. It's not a waste, right? These cow, cow guys like to think that anything that they're not eating with their cows is a waste. And that is wrong. Mm -hmm. That's a whole other webinar. We can do that sometime. I was going to say, we talk about that a lot on some of PCBFA's webinars. Got to take half and leave half and come back to it later. It's okay. Right. <laughs> um, another question. Uh, do you get some, do you see if, uh, let me start again. <laughs> do you see any kinds of loss uh, with your stripper header? Uh, Lucas says, I can't seem to get ours uh, under a bushel per acre for any crops and sometimes quite a bit higher than that for loss with those. Yeah, shellborns are an art, uh, setting them. I mean, you get, you do, I mean, when you're running massive material through your combines, it, it helps. Um, but yeah, no, there always is a little bit of a loss on stripper headers. I know this year is really dry down south here. And uh, yeah, we are running higher loss because the stripper header needs kind of a wall of material to push through. And uh, so that that's kind of what keeps the materials in. And yeah, sometimes we're, yeah, it's it's right around that, depending on the crop. But I mean, sometimes it's up in that three, four bushels the acre loss on, on, on canola, for instance. But we don't, we feel that the increase in residue is so much worse, so much better. And one of the other things that we notice is we get a lot more header loss, but because our cleaning, because we're running so much less other material through the combine, our combine harvester losses are lower. So your header loss might be higher, but your harvester loss might be lower. So you're probably similar. Um, and I mean, you are saving a lot of fuel. Like we're saving 30 to 50% less fuel than in the old, like then when we used to swath and pick up on our canola, that's the only thing I've, we've been on stripper headers for 30 years. So the only thing I've ever done is picked up swaths when we used to swath canola. I mean, just the fuel usage was just insane. So yes, sometimes the losses can be higher. There's ways to set that and adjust that. Good teeth, like we just change the teeth on our stripper headers way too often. That helps. And uh, it's roughly how we do it. But yeah, they, they can be higher losses, but we think that it's a whole picture economics things, right? We'll take a little more losses just for the residue and the fuel savings, depending on the crop. This year with flax, we were very, very, very cautious. At, I mean, at harvest time, it was $45 flax. We were we were pretty cautious on losses on the crop, but at $3 malt bar or $3 feed barley, who cares, right? So. All right. Uh, I have one question here that would probably be a good one for all three of you. Uh, and we'll just see if, see if one of you has an answer. Um, how much inter, um, intercropping peas, uh, the benefit there is that they can fix nitrogen from the air. So do you see a nitrogen fertilizer saving when you're intercropping compared to a monoculture? Uh, if it's a brassica, or sorry, if it's got a uh pulse component in it i just generally don't fertilize we have done some trials with nitrogen fertilizer and whatever like yeah we'll maybe use, use some phosphate or whatever but we just generally 
seem to be able to get depends what you're trying to do you just let her go just get all get either get it from the soil or get it from uh, from the pulse and I think we get some how much is very hard to quantify um, definitely I know if you do a pulse and uh, barley you have pretty you can have pretty low protein barley and you can your soil sample before and after can be very much you can you can mine a lot out of your your end and come out of your soil too so not really an answer but I don't know I just I just go if there's the pulse there I'm not giving nitrogens so Uh, do you guys have anything else? Is this video came on? We, uh, th the way we take it is we're usually nitrogen deficient going into seeding. So that's where our 50% of our uh, nitrogen for our target yield uh, come from. So usually in our soil samples, we'll have anywhere from from 10 to 20 pounds of N still left in the ground, which wouldn't really grow too much on the, on, uh, on uh, if we didn't add any nitrogen. Um, but uh, yeah, usually we kind of add the full meal deal fertility to it and just back off on the nitrogen, depending on what our soil samples say. Makes sense. All right. I think with that, we'll go uh, on to Taylor. So uh, Taylor farms with his dad and his brother. Uh, they operate a mixed farm of about 1,300 acres of crop, uh, 90 head of cow-calf, and 60 pigs that are directly marketed uh, near Glendon. They started intercropping in 2020, added more acres in 2021, and should be 100% intercrop in 2022. Okay, can you uh, hear me still? Yeah, sounds good. Perfect. So yeah, like uh, Joanna said, uh, farm in Northeast Alberta, MD of Bonneville to be specific, with my uh, dad, brother, and myself, and then nephews whenever they're around. Um, got into the intercropping mainly on peas and oats. Um, uh, the backstory on that is uh, was a cover crop meeting with uh, Lara and Kevin Elmy and was wanting to figure out, <coughs> excuse me, how to get uh, grass into our uh, pea production so we didn't burn up so much carbon and more residue and whatnot. And Kevin's like, well, just put oats. I was like, well, yeah, well, they grow too tall and like want something else. He's like, no, you combine them together. I know he'd heard about pea canola and whatnot before and wanted to do it, never did. So it's like, oh, let's try it. <laughs> so I did, uh, oh, I think it was about 400 acres in 2020 of peas and oats and kind of just went crazy from there. This year we did uh, mainly peas barley, tried to do some peas canola, and well, we had bad flea beetles, so we had monocrop peas. So that kind of worked out, but uh, we did do some, uh, let's see here, peas, canola, oats, and that was peas, canola, uh, peas, oats with uh, volunteer canola that came mid-season. Um, seeding, we're not too fancy, we got a FlexiCoil 6000 with Barton uh, disc openers, um, seed place liquid kit. Our limiting thing is uh, we only have two tanks on our air cart, and then we pull a liquid uh, liquid cart behind. So intercropping gets kind of interesting when you have one tandem grain truck and uh, two cart system. Um, let's see where my thing is here. Um, this is our seed in our peas, oats, um, and since we only have a one tandem grain truck, we. Uh, uh, started using our grain cart to fill our air cart and that kind of got to the point where it was so fast compared to our little dinky seven inch auger on our flexicoil cart we actually started doing it on majority of our crops um, 
unless we had to use the truck, then we'd use it. But uh, it worked uh, quite well. Um, and this was the first year with our peas and oats, and that was the stand we were targeting. And it didn't quite get to. Uh, no, my mouse here is not working. There we go. It didn't quite get uh, to that kind of stand. Um, we had very poor emergence of oats. Um, we weren't too sure our area that year. Oats just didn't want to grow, so we had some really poor emergence, um, mainly peas. This is a video. I don't know if it's going to work. I take too many videos and not enough pictures, so kind of have to... And of course it's backwards to so film our drill kind of faster than any fancy Borgo uh, air seeder. Um, so yeah, it works pretty good. Now for our in-crop, um, I love uh, driving around with a track spade in the truck and digging up and yeah, I, I love pea nodules and peas is my kind of favorite crop to grow. So buddies on my Snapchat group, they kind of get bombarded with P nodule pictures all the time. They think I'm crazy, which I am. But uh, so this was our first year, peas, oats. Um, right off the start, really didn't have any issues. They like growing together um, when the oats grew. This was kind of a good uh, field. Um, our pea, oats, canola field had like very, very little oats in it just didn't want to grow so it was mainly peas and here's our pea oats canola um you can't really see any oats because there is almost none but uh this is the picture when he uh, i think two weeks after we were going to spray it pulled into the field and uh we sprayed the peas and oats with mcp amine 60 acres of jug that's the label rate so it is the proper rate um and pulled into this field and it was just so even with canola even though we had done a good burn off killed all the canola it just came back enough as like we're just gonna leave it it was 60 acres or so like we're growing pea oats canola and uh it uh there's the odd oat you can see but it actually did uh very well um, these are pea oats and like i said had a poor oat establishment, so it, you have to actually look to see the oats, but this was actually our field that we were quite happy with, with oats that year. I take too many pictures. I, I can't write worth uh, crap, and I don't like it, so <laughs> bear with me on pictures. Um, this year, uh, or last year in 21, we did a peas and barley, and of course, we had like, I think 20%. 15 or 20% of our normal rainfall and what our rainfall is on average, I haven't looked it up lately, but it ranges from three inches to 30 inches. So yeah, probably average about 17 inches, kind of like Josh, even though it seems like we're wetter most times. Um, so it uh, just kind of burnt up and they weren't as thick this year, but I really like the peas and barley um seeding rate since i didn't put it on here um when we did the peas and oats we uh, cut our pea seeding rate back from three bushels to two bushels and then put one bushel of oats on and we thought that would be enough but since the oats didn't want to grow it wasn't the greatest this year um since we wanted more cereal less pulse um we backed the peas down to one bushel and then put the barley in at uh i believe it was two bushels an acre which normally with barley we're both three since we grow a variety of barley that has really big uh plump kernels so we typically are a little higher than normal austinson barley and uh, the variety is this conlin barley so it's a short season 75 day two row uh, feed and it works really good with the peas they kind of mature very similar um, in timing um, the oats and peas kind of thought they might not mature together but they just seem to work so <laughs> i don't really question it if it works but it did 
um, herbicides, um, like I mentioned, uh, for our cereals and peas um, or flax, if you're adding flax to it, uh, MCP amine um, is pretty much the only thing you can use until you go to peas canola with so long as it's clear field canola, then you can do your Odyssey or solo. And I put this picture up, I don't know if anyone can see it, but in the middle, um, this is our first time spraying our intercrop. Uh, came back the next morning and uh, it looked like we killed the field of peas. They were all twisted um, and curled and we, yeah, kind of uh, weren't sure what happened and found out that it's normal for the MCP amine on peas, um, even at the label rate, because we had the rep out because we thought we were in trouble. And uh, they, they, yeah, they, uh, they said, well, that is a little excessive um, for a uh, uh, leaf twist and just the whole plant just curled up like you killed it. One thing, it did not change color. It stayed green, but just looked like it had a bad day. Um, so we ended up, since we weren't sure what was going on, we cut the rate back to, I think it was 100 acres of jug, and then finished the field with not even spraying it, the rest of the field, because we, we were scared we are going to have no peas. Um, in the end, interesting, uh, it acted like a plant growth regulator for the peas. So the peas got really short, well, not really short, but substantially shorter, the oats, uh, grew a little better. Um, the pea yield, um, according to the yield model in the combine, which, which was not calibrated, so it's just rough numbers. The peas were in the neighborhood of like 10 bushels an acre better where we had sprayed them and they were shorter and they were easier combine. We had more oats. Um, not exactly sure how many oats because it was, uh, we didn't really get to testing and sampling everything the way we would like to. So there was a little more oats, lots more peas, um, easier combining. Um, so yeah, now when we spray it and we see the peas just twist all the twist all the heck and you think they're gonna die, wow, well, it's normal. Um, and like I said, they don't change color, um, which kind of was a saved some sleepless nights uh, wondering if your peas were gonna die. So uh, that's the one thing. Um, you will have to watch because um, it it'll could give you a heart attack the first day you see it, um, but works very well. Um, harvest time. Um, anyone from southern Alberta would like this? I don't. So it doesn't look like that no more. Um, another video since I'm into videos. Um, this was combining our P oats the first year, and like you can you'll notice. It looks like there is uh, pretty much just like a slight wild oat problem. Um, and yeah, it uh, combined just extremely well. Didn't slow us down. Um, didn't really change any settings uh, over peas. Maybe sped the rotor up a little bit. Um, closed the concave slightly and uh, and I think 100 RPM and it just it did a really good job. The oats we thought could have been maybe thrashed a little better at times, but because um, there'd be some that would be like two oats still together. But by the time combine emptied out, went to the grain cart, they were all thrashed quite nicely. Um, our peas, canola oats, um, like you'll see, there's very little oats in it, mainly canola and peas. Um, yeah, and it combined quite well, too. Well, of course, it's going to go sideways, so <laughs> technology. So, yeah, it, uh, quite happy for a field that we thought was going to have no oats. We got, I think, was about 10 bushels of canola out of it. So that was, uh, and uh, like three bushels of oats. So we made our seed back, and that was about it on that plot field. This was our main PO field back in 2020. Um, that was a sample right in the combine hopper. Um, then uh, just a view of the field that we're combining. So yeah, it, uh, for anyone who didn't know, they think, well, wild oats got away and had a 
issue with them, but it uh, was mainly peas. Once we actually got the sample and looked at it, we were quite surprised how many oats is actually in it. Um, so we we're quite uh, quite happy, even though we would have liked to have a few more oats. Um, this field yield wise did actually better than our monocrop peas. Um, not the same field, like three miles apart, all that stuff. But um, this field, we average about 50 bushel an acre combined before separated. And our monocrop peas, they were about 30. Um, and then later on in the slides, I'll show our bushel weight difference. And it was uh, substantially better bushel weight on our uh, intercrop peas. This year is our barley. Um, in, uh, not near the amount of peas. Um, they don't like heat the same and no rain. They don't like wet feet, but they also don't like droughts. Um, so a lot less peas. We did intentionally seed less peas, but um, would have liked to have maybe a little more, but there was what is what it is. $8 barley still works. Um, the barley, we're having a harder time getting the tails off the barley which kind of sometimes when yeah you get a little too picky like i do it uh, drives you nuts but just like with the oats once we ran it through the combine green cart auger and by the time we separated them the tails were all pretty much gone so kind of looks like a really dirty messy sample but in the end it actually uh worked out pretty good um and then we do like grain bags um this year, we didn't have to use any grain bags. Um, we decreased our crop acres a bit and uh, had less crops, so filled the bins up instead. Um, but yeah, for us, no issues storing uh, in grain bags. Uh, we like them because we typically have to dry a lot of grain and just have no time to mess with it till after harvest. And uh, with intergrop, it works quite well. Uh, separation. Um, this this picture uh, was once we separated the peas out of our pea oats canola. Um, so maybe there was a little more oats than we'd thought, but that was just when we wanted to see if it was worthwhile cleaning it out. Just uh, did a few hand screens and it uh, was definitely worth it. Um, Current uh, cleaner, um, we I had a rotary screen for taking dockage out a long time ago, and uh, well, not long, but sold it like the year before we started doing intercrops. <laughs> so it was, uh, yeah, kind of pretty poor timing, but um, we're actually, we didn't even buy this cleaner. It's the brother-in-law's, uh, he does intercropping as well. So he ponied up, bought a cleaner, and we just borrow it um or exchange stuff for it so um it's a seven tube quick clean um kind of a gateway drug cleaner for intercropping um we nickname it the slow clean because it is um the numbers on the bushels of throughput are if you're taking dockage out of like corn or peas maybe and you might still have some dockage in it because oh look keep up that 10 inch auger and it's like yeah I think when we're doing high peas, uh, high pea content, we're like three to 500 bushels an hour. And they're saying, oh, well, you're like 2000. We're like, oh, sweet. So start to uh, start going. And yeah, no, not even close. So um, we do get a little bit. If you push it, you'll get a little bit of uh, a throw over a little bit of oats or barley go over peas. But that's more like 500 bushel an hour um 300 bushel an hour you do a really really good job we found um but i don't know it's uh it works and like uh you it's like drying grain you realize how many augers you don't have when you actually are using them all um you're like oh we got lots of augers yeah no you don't you end up using everything you can there was a picture I seen the other day, someone was using his combine as a grain bin. We hadn't quite got to that point yet, but you have a grain cart and trucks and you're 
you're cleaning direct we're cleaning directly into a bin for the peas and then all this if you call it screenings the oats or the barley or the combination goes into a grain cart bin and then cleaned again later um, to get the canola out so it uh yeah it uh seed cleaning plant is definitely in the like josh said uh it's in the mm, one million dollar one in the very very distant future for us but it uh we can already see the benefits of um cleaning everything before it leaves the farm regardless of intercrop um just because we have some cows um we don't really feed any grain to them very little but with this little pig enterprise they got going um they tend to eat a fair bit and they love screenings we've been feeding them on uh just screenings, nothing special and it works really good so it uh um sell their sell our screenings through the pigs for like three to four bucks a pound and uh that yeah, works pretty good once we get to the point where we have too many screenings um the idea of a pellet mill or something like that to pelletize it and this year you could probably sell that for more than your actual crop um but by the time we get to it there'll be no drought and feed will be uh cheap um but uh it is a gateway uh gateway drug to a big seed plant um these are I, um this uh are pretty much just stills i took out of videos because uh i take way too many videos not enough pictures so this is when we're doing our uh i believe this was our uh pea oats canola um so the peas are going out and the uh, canola and oats are going in the truck um yeah, the little auger, I think it was the first round of cleaning when it was new. The little auger on the quick clean quickly got, uh, took off and uh, just a hopper put under it with a better auger. Um, Cause like I said, they, they're they pretty much designed to take dockage out and like the 1960s seed plants, um, when you're doing 50% screenings, the little four inch auger just doesn't quite cut it and in a big way um, we even tried taking the belt drive off on in the one picture and put a hydraulic motor to spin it faster and it uh yeah that didn't help a whole lot so it's gone um but yeah just more pictures on the cleaning hopefully this bit video is in sideways there's kind of a loud noisy operation And uh, yeah, you can see the canola in it, some of the oats, then out the cream peas come. And then there's our mobile bin. And here I think is the last video for now. This is the screening going in. So yeah, you quickly realize that it's worth screening the screenings again. Um, so otherwise we would have, well, gave away like piles of canola and it. 23 bucks a bushel, it makes it very worthwhile to uh, screen any volunteer canola out, even if you didn't plan on it. Um, this is from this year. Um, uh, difference between our intercrop and monocrop uh, peas and barley. Um, kind of poor pictures, but um they don't look much different the the peas are the monocrop peas don't look quite as good um they're still decent like really good grade and whatnot but the peas are definitely better quality on the intercrop um first year intercropping some of the intercrop peas went not number one which we've never in our pea growing careers got a number one for peas. We didn't even know there was a number one, um, but we did get some number one peas. They wouldn't give us a premium. It's just only oh, got number one. So it's kind of like a participation award, but um, they are a lot plumper. And uh, yeah, barley really, aside from bushel weight, it didn't look much different. And I'll get to that shortly. Um, so yeah, this is the intercrop differences. 
Um, 2020, we just had peas and oats. Um, the oats, we had no monocrop oats, so there's nothing to compare to. Um, but we saw a three bush, uh, three pounds per bushel benefit to the intercrop peas in 2020. Um, once we got into 21, um, it wasn't quite as big of a difference on the peas. I don't know if it had anything to do with the drought um, and being hot and all that other good stuff, but uh, still was a pretty decent difference um, on top of quality. Barley was, mm, there was a difference, but there wasn't, wasn't much. Um, let's see here. Uh, 2022, some of our intercropping options we're looking at. Um, we're going to be adding flax. We've wanted to add flax for quite a few years, and we picked the best year to do it when seeds like 60 bucks a bushel. So, yeah, um, we're finally going to do it. But uh, we're looking at either wheat or flax, which some guys I know of have done. It seems to work pretty good. Um, they don't really compete that much, at least up here for guys who've done it. They kind of do their own thing. You typically can spray them with similar uh, chemicals if you need to get some wild oats out of them. Um, then barley and flax, that's just another option. But this year we're gonna be doing some intentional three-way mixes, mainly the barley we might do, um, probably just stick with a pea, oats, flax, because we're looking into some gluten-free oat market. So they, yeah, the premium's enough. We don't really want to grow much for barley. But uh, the interesting thing with the peas and oats, um, we, you, like I said, we spray MCP amine on them. And the one time talking to brother-in-law, I got thinking, I was like, hey, with flax, if we add flax, like we're not sure on the rates, seeding rates yet, but uh, it's like, wonder if we could spray that with MCP amine. So quickly pulled out the blue book and uh, sure enough, you can spray flax with MCP amine at actually a higher rate. So it's like, okay, golden. We're, uh, um, we can still keep our chemical the same way and throw flax in. So um, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, we're looking at probably a bushel of flax, oh, so no, not that much. A bushel of peas, uh, probably two bushels of oats, um, and then about 10 to 20 pounds of flax is kind of what we're looking at right now. Um, we're gonna play around with that a bit. Um, and then would like to finally get a crop of pea canola since we've kind of wanted to do that from the start, but never actually did. So the only thing is compared to our pea oats flax, the peas canola, profitability wise um is about neck and neck minus we got a little more seed cost with the peas canola so it's actually not very lucrative for us to grow canola anymore uh when we're looking at peas oats flax so it uh we used to grow way too much canola and now it's kind of losing its uh flavor for us but those are what we're looking at for this year um yeah, um, I guess the other, I didn't put in the slides, I realized after the other guys. Um, fertility, we're a little different. Um, we don't put, we put very little to no fertility with the drill. We put uh, biostimulants down our uh, liquid kit. Um, so it's not, not the same thing, but similar to like Eco T and some other stuff um, we've been using for the last I think, seven years. Um, really good luck with it. Um, any fertility we do put on, we put on foliar with the sprayer. So there's sometimes we'll go over the field, like it ranges from two to four times. Um, we've done tissue testing in the past and that's kind of what we base some of our applications on. We're looking at going into sap testing, which is supposed to be way better. Um, so yeah, we're a little different with that. Um, I, since going to mainly foliar spraying, we've, uh, we've noticed disease has gone down, our lodging has gone away, and some of our yields have actually been better than when we put all our fertility with the drill. So oh, it's, uh, we're a little weird. I like, like I tell people, actually brother-in-law started the thing. He likes his tin foil hat on. And uh, 
when some people hear about some of the stuff we're doing, they think we're, yeah, a little out there and we are out there. So it, uh, <laughs> that uh, fertility, yeah. And then also we um, haven't put any nitrogen on um, for I think it's seven years. Um, so we also grow most of, well, everything, even our, when we were monocrop, um, because we've only been intercropping, this is this will be a third year. Even with our monocrop, we uh, uh, quit putting nitrogen on. Back uh, 2015 was the first year, um, and yeah, uh, so yeah, it, uh, intercropping I think probably helps with that a bit. Our yields didn't actually go down when we cut our nitrogen out, which actually the first year I did it, um, we kind of thought we might not actually get a crop on the field we didn't put it on, and. Uh, we actually got some of the best canola we ever grew that year. So it, uh, and yeah, it's, it hasn't really changed. So it's, uh, that kind of sets us way into the, the fringe tinfoil hat, crazy people stuff. So, <laughs> it, uh, but for us, it seemed to work. Um, but yeah, other than that, um, yeah, I guess that's, uh, there's some, uh, I forgot to put my phone number up there, but if you really want to uh, email me and yeah, get my phone number. Um, and uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you really want. Sometimes I post nothing or I post just totally crazy, useless stuff. So <laughs> no politics, at least every for every uh, couple of days. So <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess any questions, probably none. All right. We don't have questions yet, but we'll see how it goes. Usually people take a couple minutes to type them up. So. <laughs> yeah. Over there. Uh, here's one. What foliar fertility plan did you use? Um. Bye -bye, bye -bye. Um, foliar fertility, we've been using uh, mainly Alpine and Omex products, um, mainly higher in phosphorus um, and a little bit in potassium. So like be a HKW18 um, for Alpine, we really like that stuff um, for foliar. Normal G22 Alpine stuff. Um, We've kind of been switching more to Omex lately just because of the dealer. Um, and it'd be similar stuff. Um, nothing too crazy with that. Um, and then boron, your micros and all that jazz. So um, yeah, pretty boring. <laughs> Maybe it's just because we've done it so long we seem to uh, we think it's boring, but. Uh, and follow up on that, are you applying tank mixed with your inner crop or? Tank mix. Uh, I think the foliar stuff. Is oh, what yeah, to. with our herbicide, uh, pretty much aside from a burn off, and I guess I didn't mention that for our burn offs, we'll use either uh, glyphosate or we've actually been using a bit of uh, glufosinate, so uh, Liberty, because um, we've had some potential roundup issues um with it hindering a, some crops so uh we've been playing around with that but aside from our burn off every pass in the field whether it's got chemical or not will have fertility so so yeah with tank mix or herbicides with uh some form of fertility so that's kind of when we do use Odyssey on peas, um, once we start tank mixing a herbicide, we don't got our two weeks of uh, peas turn yellow and die or try to die. Like you go fishing uh, kind of thing after you spray Odyssey or Viper even sometimes. Now, uh, once we start doing that, adding the fertility, it just, it doesn't even have a sick day it seems so. Um, we do cut the herbicide by about 20% when we add the foliar in. Um, and it seems to actually work a little better. So yeah, hope that answers awesome. it. Uh, will you be 
seeding all of your species uh, down the same seed row? Yeah, unfortunately, um, we don't have the double shoot on the drill. Um, ideally, I would, in a perfect world, I'd like to have, um, I guess they call alternating rows. So you have a different uh, species in each row, like Josh does. Um, but right now with uh, just a single shoot drill, we actually might have a, a second drill this year that has double shoot, um, paired row kind of thing. And if it if we do, we will try and uh, have uh, different species in each row. Um, so the deep ones would go down the fertilizer shank um, or fertilizer run, then the shallower ones would go down the other the shallow shallow runs. Um, so I I don't know. I don't see much of an issue. Some people say there's no issue. Some people say it's better to have split rows or alternating rows. I would prefer to have alternating rows, but right now it's all mixed together. So, Right on. And if you have not enough tanks on the drill, then uh, when you have two tanks and you're putting down three products, you end up having to mix products together. So like would be like oats and flax gets mixed together and then peas are in a separate tank so yeah i'd love a five tank borgo you know i'm not a fan of borgo that it'd be just sweet awesome all right i don't see any other questions perfect so thank you very much um all three of you for coming on, or four, I suppose, <laughs> uh, uh, for coming on. And uh, yeah, I think we got some good questions answered. And it was very interesting to, to see how three different operations are doing intercropping. <laughs> uh, Kelly, do you have anything else to, or Lance, do you have anything else to close off the evening? Uh, no, just a reminder that we do have the last um, last intercropping session um, featuring the latest research in intercropping with uh, Lana Shaw, who's been uh, doing a lot of research for a really long time, so she should be really interesting, as well as Alan Lee. Um, so uh, it's a separate registration link, so make sure that you register and uh, attend. And of course, this webinar will be available for everybody to view after as well. Right on. So thank you very much for presenting and everybody for attending. <laughs> awesome.